Hi Mad Fans, today's video is part of an online course that I tutor for Oxford University. Um, I thought I'd put it on the YouTube channel just so that more people can access it and if you're interested in the Oxford course you can type into Google Oxford Continuing Education and GIS and if you Google that you should see Introducing Mapping Spatial Data and GIS Online. If you go to that page, you can see the course summary. So if you'd like to book on this course, please do. Um, it does run for 10 weeks and it's kind of self-paced, uh, but we do expect you to have each practical done by the end of the week. Uh, you can see all the information on the side here. So if you're interested in that, um, please look it up and sign up. Any questions, feel free to ask me. Today we are looking at symbolizing and labeling vector data and I just wanted to run through some of the more common things that you might want to do with vector symbols. So we've got this good old practice data set that we've seen before and the green bits on here are rivers. So to begin with for the rivers I am going to have a look at the attribute table. So if I right click and go to open attribute table we can see what we've got here. I've got these rivers from Hot OSM. Uh, we've got lots of categories, not all of them are filled up, lots of fields. But we do have a unique identifier, and that's OSM ID up here. So if I symbolize by that, I'm going to get unique symbols for all of our rivers. So if I right click, go to properties. Have a look in the symbology, and up at the top here, we've got single symbol. If I use the drop down, we can do categorized graduated or rule based. I'm going to go for categorized and then I'm going to use OSM ID and I know that that's a unique identifier for each of the rivers that are shown here and then I'm going to classify it. QGIS has rightly pointed out that I've got 6,594 entries. Uh, that's quite a lot and it could take a little bit of time but I'm going to okay it anyway and OK that. Now it's going to take some time to refresh on the screen but it's done it fairly quickly and look at that. Amazing Technicolor Rivers of Honduras. Now this is kind of dumb. You don't really want to be doing unique identifiers for rivers. It's not that useful. So instead I'm going to open up the symbology again and go to properties into the symbology and this time I'd just like to use a single symbol and I'm going to use a simple line. You'll see here that where it says line, if I click on simple line, then I get a lot more options down below. So I can choose my straight width, I can do an offset if I wanted, I could change the style of the line, dashed or anything like that. But really, I just want these rivers to be blue to be a bit more representative of water. If I OK that, then they all turn blue. They're a little bit thick, actually. I'm going to thin them down. So if I go back into properties, and have a look at the width. Instead of 0.6, I'm going to go with 0.4. Let's see what that looks like. Apply that. There we go. They're a little bit thinner. Don't forget this is hot OSM data, so you can tell in some areas they have been more concentrated in terms of recording rivers. Uh, hot OSM data is not always necessarily complete, but it is very good and do contribute where you can to map -thons. Now let's have a look at our lakes. Lakes are over here. Currently they're a little bit green, so let's go into that. And instead of a line here, we've got a polygon, obviously, to represent our lakes. So let's have a look at what we can do with these and how it differs. So here we've got a fill and we've got simple fill. Again, there is some uh, suggestions down here, but we can also click on simple fill and that gives us more options. So we've got a fill style, we've got fill color, and we've got stroke color, um, an outline as well. So let's go for the fill color to be a similar blue to what our lakes were, or to what our rivers were got a solid fill and in terms of the stroke color I'm just going to make it a little bit lighter I think so let's just make it 
a little bit opaque and apply that and there our lakes have turned the same blue as our rivers we could change that we could go in for a bit more of a deeper blue just so that we've got some distinction between the rivers and the lakes and apply that and then we've got a bit of outline to our lakes so that's what fills look like of course you've got different fill styles that you can use um, lots and lots of different ones there so you can play around with that and get your map looking pretty we've looked at lines we've looked at polygons now let's have a quick look at points let's have a look at our volcanoes and we'll go into the attribute table again always a good place to start get familiarized with your attribute table see what data you're dealing with and i've got quite a nice one here elevation so i'm going to use elevation in order to style my volcanoes and we've got a lot of volcanoes down here in el salvador so i'll focus on that area and if i right click on this and go to properties again and we're into symbology up at the top, we've got the same options as before, but we've got a few more now uh, because we're in QGIS 3. We can do point clusters, we can do heat maps, we can do point displacement, all kinds of things. So I'm going to do a graduated symbol and I'm going to use the elevation to do that. And we're going to go from white through to red and I can change that to whatever color I want and classes let's have a look at that we've got equal interval i've got five different classes actually i'm going to change my color ramp and i want to go from hmm let's go from red to blue that's all looking good i am going to classify this so for each of our different elevations we are going to have they're going to fall into one of five classes and you can see red down at the bottom here we have the low volcanoes and up at the top here with blue it's getting colder as we get up uh, it is the higher volcanoes so if i apply that okay it you can see how the color of our volcanoes has changed that's quite cool we can tell at a simple glance which of the volcanoes are high which ones are low uh, the red ones being the lowest the blue ones being the highest now if we zoom out again if i right click on my countries and go to zoom to layer you can see all of our layers in the viewer and you'll notice that honduras is a different color to guatemala el salvador and nicaragua and belize is a different color again so what i'm going to do with these countries is actually restyle them so I'll go onto countries and go to properties. There is a shortcut here if you just double click on countries. Then it just pops up with those uh, properties automatically, which is quite nice. Currently we've got categorized. Uh, I am also going to go for categorized, but I'm going to reclassify these. It's going to be on country name. Uh, the symbol is going to be fine. Random colors. I'd like to classify those. Ooh, now all it's done is added a new one and that's because we've already classified these. So if I select all of these, if I hold down shift, then I can select all of them and I can remove all of those. And instead, simple fill, that looks good. Random colors, that's great. Country name, and I'm gonna go for classify. Now I have all the different random colors. This is gonna be a very bright map, but hey ho. Down at the bottom here, we have an extra one, and that is what is known as all of the values. So if I did have some polygons that didn't have a country name, they'd just be colored with this color. I don't have any of those, so I'm just going to remove this, get rid of it, and let's have a look at our rainbow map. Let's OK that. Wow, that's garish. All right. So I might want to change those colors, uh, but this is obviously just for demonstration, not for production. Now let's have a look at how the different data types respond to labeling. So I'm just going to right click here and go into properties again. And we're going to have a look at, at the labels for countries. So if I go to labels, this is a polygon layer. 
So you can see that we've got options here for placement and the placement is going to be offset from a centroid, horizontal, free, could be around the centroid, using the perimeter, using the perimeter curved. The centroid is going to be visible polygons or whole polygons, etc, etc. So we've got lots of different options here for how it's going to be labelled. And it's currently labelled anyway, we've got country name up there, so that's all fine. We're just going to keep those as they are. Let's go on to our volcanoes and we'll have a quick look at our attribute table again. We've got location, status and then we've got name. It might be quite nice to label these with their name. Now this is a point layer, so we might see some different options in the labeling function. I'm going to go for labels, it's going to be single labels. And for our placement this time, it's going to be, you can see we've got less choices because this is a point layer rather than a polygon layer. So cartographic around the point, offset from the point, etc. And I'm going to label it with the name of the volcano. We can set a priority here as well. So this is whether it has priority over other labels, other layers, other features. And there is lots of other things that we can do in terms of styling them. We can have backgrounds, we can change the formatting of the text. We can do scale dependent visibility, depending on how far or how far out you're zoomed in or out. Um, and we can OK all of this. So this is just going to put our labels around the point, zero meters from the point, and it's got a fair to middling priority. Let's OK that. Wow, lots and lots of labels. So you can see that these labels are all over the place. QGIS may not have been able to draw all of the labels at certain scales. Let's see if we zoom out loads. We have very few names there, it can only fit a few in. But if we zoom in closer, all of our volcanoes are labelled. Now we're going to look at labelling lines. And we'll use major roads to do this just because it's in this project. But if we open up the attribute table, you'll see that it's not the best piece of data to do this with. Just because we don't have anything of interest really in the attribute table. We could use root description and this is just going to call all of them a primary root, but it'll show you how these are labeled at least. So if we close the attribute table, then I'm going to double click on roads, bring up the labeling and instead of no labels, I'll go to single labels and we're going to use root description. That's fine and looks all right. You'll notice that in terms of placement, we've now got parallel curved horizontal. And we can do offsets as well, all that usual good stuff. So I'm going to OK that and we'll have a look at what this looks like. Wow, tons of primary roots, great. And this looks really busy. Um, so you can spend a long time getting your labeling right. And if we zoom right out, you can see that that looks really, really busy. So what we might want to do, and something that I haven't shown you yet, is do scale dependent labeling. So if we get back into our roads labels, here we are. And if I go back to rendering, here we've got scale dependent visibility. Just going to check that and I'm going to set it to 1 to 1.2 million and apply that. And you can see our scale down here. Currently we are 1 to 2.3 million. So if I apply this because we are on the minimum scale, i.e. the most zoomed out that you'll be able to see it, that's at 1.2. We're currently at 2.3 million. So if I apply this, what do you think is going to happen to the labels? <gasps> they vanished. All right, so we okay that. And keep an eye on your scale. And as we move in, then they appear. We're at 1.19 in terms of millions. And you can see that the labels are there. Now you can see them moving around. Don't forget you can pin your labels if you want to and make sure that they're there. You can also force all the labels to be shown all the time. Uh, you can do that in here. Show all labels for this layer, including colliding labels. So if labels are colliding, then by default, QGIS is not going to show them. But there we go, that's a longer video and it's just covering all of our vector 
symbology and labeling as well. So if you want me to go into any more detail with these, please let me know, like specifics, and I'll be happy to do that. But don't forget, please like, subscribe, leave a comment below, and don't forget to be happy while you're mapping. Goodbye.